Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on the Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It's my pleasure to welcome Kathleen Petticord to the show today. She is the founder of Live and Invest Overseas. She has a long history in the business of publishing and teaching people about living abroad and all of the different destinations around the world that may be intriguing to you from an adventure perspective, a cost of living perspective, and a tax haven perspective, if I may say, a business perspective, etc. So I think you'll really enjoy this interview with Kathy. And welcome to the show, Kathy. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you today. My pleasure. So you're talking to us from Panama City. You're you're in Central America. And tell us what's going on in the world of living and investing overseas. (laughs) Well, in very exciting news, not very good news, but very exciting recent news here in Panama is that the, uh, the country signed an information exchange treaty or agreement with the United States. This was a big deal because Panama is one of the, the, has been one of the top jurisdictions around the world from a lot of points of view. It's a it's a top place to think about retiring, about living, starting a business, investing, but as well, it's been a top banking haven. And this has changed with the signing of this agreement, which, which really, I think, probably means the end of the banking industry in, in Panama. So that's the bad news from down here in Panama, and it's the news on everyone's mind. We had a conference here earlier this month, and it was a conference on going offshore. We called it our offshore summit. So we were talking about all these issues to do with tax havens and banking overseas and asset protection and asset protection strategies, etc. So it was literally the day before that conference began that Panama signed this agreement with the United States. So it was it was a, a very much hotly debated topic throughout the, throughout the conference. And it, it is a shame uh, that uh, from my point of view and a lot of other people's point of view that Panama did this, but to keep things in perspective, Panama remains really a very appealing place still from a lot of points of view, uh, especially from the point of view of a place to live or retire. And I would say that Panama is probably the best place in the world right now to start a business, an international internet business, for example. So now, can you be a little more specific on the banking issue? Because I know that the Obama administration has really been going after, I mean, there was a big thing earlier this year with UBS and the Swiss bank accounts and so forth. And I heard that after January 1st of 2011, America Americans will not be able to open foreign bank accounts or... or... No, that's that's not true. It's not that you can't open a foreign bank account. It's that the reporting requirements are becoming more rigorous and you better be very careful that you're following them to the letter of, of the law. But but in fact, it's always been the case that had to report a, a bank account in another jurisdiction, an offshore bank account. So the fact that you, you need to report an account is not the same as saying that you can't have one. The trouble, though, is because the United States has been taking this issue up so aggressively and uh, causing trouble and making things generally difficult for havens with a history of supporting bank secrecy and bank 
banking privacy, like Switzerland. They've been making things so difficult for banks and the financial industries in general in those in those jurisdictions. Those jurisdictions have gotten to the point, in some cases, including in Switzerland, of saying, okay, enough. We just won't take Americans as clients. It's just not worth the hassle. So while it's not at all, and I think this is important for Americans to understand, it is not at all illegal for you to have a bank account in another country. The trouble from a practical point of view is that it's becoming harder and harder to find a country that will open a bank account for you because Switzerland, to give one example, has said they just won't anymore. They don't want any more American clients. It's just not worth the hassle. One of my colleagues is very interested in Belize, for example, and he said, if you want to open a bank account in another country, you better do it before January 1st. So that's not the case. I mean, is it that if you do it before January 1st, you don't have to do the reporting? No, oh, even if, all along, you've been meant to, to be reporting any account in another country. And a, a recent change, I think, within the past couple of years was that in addition to simply reporting the existence of an offshore account, you had to report the the highest account balance throughout that year, that preceding year. So if you had an account in Panama, say, and at one point during the year it had a balance of $100,000, that was the highest balance it had, you had to report that bank account in Belize. There's a certain form that the IRS provides for this. And then you had to indicate that the, that at one point during the year it had as much as $100,000 in it. From an international banking point of view, it, it really isn't that anything is changing for Americans. There are other laws coming into effect, other things changing that I think have some some dire implications uh, looking ahead to say uh, 2013, but not to do with just the simple fact of having a bank account in another country. Since you left that out there, and we've got a lot of stuff to cover, but do you want to just mention some of those dire things coming up real quickly? I I know we've got a lot of Well, there's one thing, and yeah, the trouble is this stuff gets complicated very quickly, but there's one thing I'll try to uh, address it as uh, succinctly as I can. But starting in 2013, the United States is going to require that any time an American wires money from a U.S. bank to a foreign bank or from a foreign bank to a U.S. bank, anytime a U.S. bank is involved in a wire transfer by an American, that that bank has to determine if tax is owed on that money or not, if it's pre-tax or post-tax money, if oh there's any gosh. tax they want it. What a giant now, burden. Huh? How, well, right, well, the, there's no way for a bank to make that determination. There's no way a banker can know that. And and I've spoken with many bankers in many jurisdictions and they agree. There's absolutely no way for us to know that. So what we'll have to do, what this means in practice, is that all banks will simply have to start withholding this tax at the point of the wire. It's it's a 30% tax. It's a withholding. It's not a new tax. And in theory, you should be able to get it refunded, rebated, returned when you file your tax return for that year. But it's say in January of one of 2013, you send a wire to Belize. Well, the U.S. bank is meant to to decide is that pre is that money taxable. And if it if it is, they're meant to withhold 30 percent. Now that's January. So the next year, you're, you know, by the time you file your taxes for that year, which will be a year later, you presumably theoretically can get that 30 percent back. But imagine the 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 burden that is now on the banking industry, the global banking industry, to right. deal with this. So and no one even understands how to deal with it in the banking industry. But the poor American who has, for example, saved up a few hundred thousand dollars to buy the beach home of his dreams in some overseas retirement haven, now when he goes to send that money, to wire the money to make the purchase, he's at risk of having 30% of it chopped off the top. And if you if you bought, if you you negotiated to buy a house for $300,000, well, the, the seller is going to want the $300,000, not $300,000 minus the 30% that the banks are going to withhold for the IRS, which means you're going to have to make up that amount in advance. Wow. While the IRS takes your 30% and holds on to it. So uh, we spent a lot of time talking about this. It's part of the new Hire Act that was enacted this past year. And uh, it's it's a crazy thing because it, it doesn't have anything to do with the point of the act itself, of the piece of legislation, but it was bundled in there. And so these were the kinds of things that we talked about during this, this offshore summit. Amazing. It's getting it's getting really tough. I think, Kathleen, the, the message here is that if you want to do stuff internationally, if you really want to be a citizen of the world and maybe diversify your wealth, the thing to do is really act quickly, isn't it? Because the, the direction we're going in, yeah. Yeah, a, f- a friend of mine uh, who spoke at the at the uh, conference, he said, 
if you're standing on a railroad track and you can see the freight train coming at you from a few miles down the track, well, you ought to be able to get out of the way and not get hit. And he said, the, the freight train is coming. We're standing on the track, and if you look down, it's coming. And so you, more or less you've got about two years before this, the, the uh, terms of this Hire Act, for example, in 2013 come into place. Amazing. Well, let's talk globally, if we could, about the world. Maybe well, let's just talk about some different destinations and see what your take on them is. I'd like to start, if we could, because when I read your newsletter and I read other newsletters and so forth about the international climate and where the great real estate deals are, and etc., it seems mostly focused on Central and South America. Why is that? It's because it's that that's the part of the world that's most easily accessible. It's close. It's easily accessible. There's a lot of sunshine. And for the most part, you can live for less than you can in the United States. So it has all those big pluses going for it. And that's not to say that there aren't other parts of the world, Europe and Asia, where there's a lot of sunshine, where there's a great lifestyle on where you can live very cheaply. In fact, you can live cheaper right now in Asia than in Central or South America, but it's halfway around the world. So that's a trade-off for many people. And, and so when you say that, you're addressing lar- a largely U.S.-centric or North American-centric audience probably, right? Exactly. Exactly. Now, Kathleen, so within within Central and South America, you're based in Panama. Just a quick snippet on why you like it so much. I've got several countries and destinations I'd like to ask you about. Panama, we, we like because, for all the reasons I just said, it's nearby the United States. It's a travel hub. It's, it's very accessible from all over North America, but it's also a good jumping off point for travel to Europe and even Asia, uh, and certainly throughout Latin America. It's sunny, great weather, summer year-round, lots of beaches, great diversity of lifestyle. There's Panama City, which is a city without compare in the region. There's no other city in Central America that compares to Panama City in terms of infrastructure, banking infrastructure, uh, telecommunications, etc. It's affordable. It's not super cheap. It's not as cheap as it once was, but it's certainly affordable. And for us, the, the two big important reasons why we're here ourselves, it's it is really the best place to run a business because of the infrastructure, because of the English-speaking, educated, affordable labor pool, and because of the, the uh, tax advantages, both corporate and personal. Now, last time I was in Panama, I remember looking at properties there and so forth, and, and they had these fantastic deals where you could get a 10 or even 20-year exemption from property taxes. That's true. The the, uh, the property tax exemption thing has law has been uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of funny it's almost a joke here because it's it's been renewed and renewed and renewed and reconsidered and then renewed and so yes it, it but it in fact did finally end last year but there are still many properties available with some time remaining on the property tax exemption so for example the 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 property the condo or what have you would carry the exemption with it. So if someone bought a place with a 20-year tax exemption two years ago and you buy it from him today, you inherit the remaining 18 years of exemption. Ah, okay. Oh, well, that's pretty good. Now, I'm wondering yeah. when that when that exemption went away for, say, new properties or properties that didn't have that exemption with them, because it goes with the properties you mentioned, did that have a chilling effect on values in, in the real estate market? Not really. It, property taxes aren't that big of a, of a deal here anyway, so it it didn't have a huge effect. But the market here in general, just coincidentally, but not at the same time, has changed dramatically. So the uh, the real estate prices have fallen over the past two plus years in Panama City, especially, have fallen probably 25 percent, in some cases even more, in the past two years in Panama City. And the market has slowed dramatically. But this is a function of what's gone in the world and and in general, and not really not anything to do with the property tax situation. Kathleen, what about Argentina? That's the other big one I always hear people talking about, and I'm always reading about it. Uh, Argentina is a great place. The, the trouble in Argentina right now is that it's, it's experiencing very high rate of inflation. And so the, the cost of living in Argentina has gotten much more expensive uh, over the past two to three years. And if inflation continues, frankly, the, the cost of living could become outright expensive in the next few years. That said, right now, because remember, cost is, is a completely relative thing, cost of living. And so while I say there's been a great rate of inflation and the costs have increased in the past couple of years, it started at a very low point 
two to three years ago, the cost of living in Argentina was one of the world's best bargains. And so the uh, rate of inflation has, has increased the cost of living, but not to the point where you would go down there and be struck by how expensive it is. It's just not as cheap as it was. But again, the rate, the inflation continues. The fundamental thing about Argentina to remember is that it's a basket case of a country, and I believe that it always will be. I don't. I, I think that's almost part of Argentina's charm, and I think the Argentinians like it that way. But, uh, <laughs> but, that's funny. It's, but if you just hold that aside, Argentina has so much to offer. Buenos Aires is such a great city, and then Argentina. Argentina, you know, is huge and has such diversity of geography and and many beautiful uh, areas and cities. What about Brazil? Brazil, I think, is a great choice for living at the beach, great cheap choice for living at the beach. I'm not very bullish on it from a a personal, private, real estate investment point of view. And I I make that point because I, I, I take a lot of heat for that. In fact, a lot of people are very hot on the Brazil market for the average real estate investor. And I think it's just too complicated of a market for the little guy to go into. There are exchange controls. It's very difficult to get a bank account. The currency fluctuates always. It's always moving. So there are, there are just a lot of risks for the little guy. So I, I, I am not one who proposes, or I'm not a, a proponent of going and, and investing in a condo on the beach thinking thinking that you're, you're going to make a lot of money that way. I think that there are just too many risks. And frankly, it's it's very hassle-filled investment for the for the potential return. But on the other hand, again, Brazil has beautiful beaches and is just a really affordable, great place to, to escape to the beach. Let's move up a bit. And I want to ask you about Belize since we mentioned it before. I'm a big fan of Belize. Belize is a a tiny little country that nobody paid any attention to forever. And then Temptation Up was filmed on one of its little Caribbean islands and suddenly people thought this you know this was just a, a paradise escape in the Caribbean and in many ways it is. Belize has something else going for it which is a it's still intact very strong bank secrecy law and tradition and so Belize is one place where an American can still open bank accounts in a jurisdiction that uh, supports banking secrecy. So I do recommend Belize from that point of view and the reason it so far has, has been able to maintain its bank secrecy status or position is is because it's so under the radar, because really it's so small and there's not much money at stake in the scheme of, of global banking and, and nobody just pays it any attention. That, that could change if, if too many people figure out that, that it is kind of a, a, it's almost, it's just an undiscovered banking haven. And if too many people cop onto that and more money starts to flow through Belize, then America, the United States government might start paying attention. But right now that's not the case. And uh, meantime, Belize is just a great place to be a, a great place to kind of opt out of 21st century uh, life. Right, right. Okay. So it's a it's sort of the club med vacation where you really get away from it all. When you were talking about this stuff, Kathleen, what about the real estate markets in these various places? We sort of talked about the banking climate, the business climate, and you did mention it when it came to Panama. Of course, Argentina's got the inflation. Are we at the right time in the cycle of, of the Belize market, for example? I think that Belize is a good place to invest in land. I'm very bullish right now on investing in land. And I know I'm not the only one that's not really a new idea, but I think we're at the time in the cycle for investing in land, especially productive land, and that's something that Belize has at, at very, very low prices. In the interior of the country, Belize is so tiny, it's funny to realize that in, it's, it's in fact two very different places geographically. It's the Caribbean coast and islands, and then inland, it's beautiful rainforest-covered mountainsides with rivers and waterfalls and lush jungle, and in that part of the country, there there is a lot of land available for sale, very undeveloped and very cheap and very fertile. So I do recommend Belize from from a land buy point of view. And when you say productive land, you mean farmland? Farmland, exactly. So to grow all kinds of citrus products, fruits, hardwoods. Timber is a big product in Belize, and uh, they raise cattle as as well. Right, right. Interesting. Costa Rica, I was just there two months ago, and my Mm -hmm. impression of Costa Rica is it's sort of like everybody discovered it and the opportunity has disappeared to some extent. What do you think? I would agree completely. I first recommended Costa Rica. It was one of the first countries I I wrote about and recommended when I started my career, which was more than 25 years ago, uh, covering this beat. And back then, Costa Rica made a lot of sense because it, for one important reason, it was so unbelievably cheap. And they were they were in the business of of attracting foreign retirees at the time. They had their their famed 
pensionado program full force, and they were working very hard to make it as easy and as attractive as possible for foreign retirees, especially American retirees, to relocate there. It was very undeveloped, and the, the coastlines, the country itself, very undeveloped. The infrastructure, very woefully undeveloped. The roads in bad state of repair, the bridges collapsing. But you didn't mind all that because it was so cheap. But then what happened was a tremendous rate of inflation in every regard, in cost of living and especially in real estate, especially in the cost of beachfront real estate. So throughout the 80s and 90s, the cost of real estate in Costa Rica just appreciated at dramatic rates. The cost of living went up and up. The Costa Ricans decided, all right, we've got enough American retirees. We don't want any more. We're tired of all these gringos among us. And and I think, I was there in Costa Rica recently as well. I think that these days you get almost an anti-gringo feeling in the country, that the Ticos have, are kind of tired of, of these gringos among them, and they're happy for you to come and spend your money, but then they'd really like you to go home. So so you don't feel so welcome there. It doesn't feel so friendly anymore. The Costa Ricans have become a little jaded with their whole experience of the past 30 years. The place is still expensive, far more expensive than uh, Panama, for example, Yet, the infrastructure hasn't improved at all. The country of Costa Rica didn't build a new road for, for almost 40 years until last year. I, I'll tell you something. I could not believe how bad the roads are there. I mean, literally, Kathleen, potholes the size of a yeah. Volkswagen bug. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. unbelievable. It's, so, it's, so then when it's, when it's not so cheap, you look around and think, well, geez, what? I don't, there's no point here. If it's cheap, you put up with a lot, you know, and the cheaper it is, the more you'll put up with. But if it's not cheap and it's also not nice, well, you want to move on. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. Let's jump on a jumbo jet here if we could, and let's go across the, the ocean, and let's talk about Europe, particularly maybe, well, anything you want to talk about, but France, I've heard about these lease option programs. Eastern Europe, of course, has kind of had its run up and its crash. Are there good opportunities in Eastern Europe or, or West, anywhere you want to talk about in Europe, Ireland, whatever? Well, uh, oh, Ireland. Well, there's a place to start. Ireland is, <laughs> is a market that I, I pay attention to because we live there. I, when I left the States about 13 years ago and we moved first, my family and I, to Ireland. We lived in Waterford for seven years and we were there at the height of the Celtic Tiger so we were there in the absolute boom years when this little country was just a wash in money people were making so much money so fast that, and they didn't know what to do with it there was so much construction property prices were ridiculous in some parts of the country they were appreciating it at rates of 100% a year for year on year on year it was craziness and the whole time we were there I was thinking this can't last because it doesn't make any sense there's nothing in Ireland there's no industry. Ireland has no economy of its own. The, the Celtic tiger, even the, my Irish friends would admit, it, it's not a Celtic tiger, it's an American tiger. It was just an imported part of the American boom because they lured American companies to go there and set up call centers and, and to invest otherwise. That's why we were there. We moved our business there as part of a, an investment program that the Irish government was offering at the time and so we took advantage of tax incentives and other, other benefits. So the country was importing all of this investment but still not creating any economy of its own. And then when it, it, it got very expensive, we, when we moved there, the cost of doing business and of labor was, was affordable, if not cheap. It accelerated quickly. And by the time I left, the cost of doing business in Ireland was very expensive. We weren't the only ones to notice that. So the other big companies who had moved there to take advantage of the business benefits were moving on. Even back then, so this would have been five or six years ago, they, the big companies were beginning to move on, and they moved uh, in large part to Eastern Europe and set up their call centers and factories in Eastern Europe where the cost of doing business was, was much lower. And so then was watched ever since we left Ireland and waited because you just knew it, it couldn't continue, and it has unraveled in just a, a cataclysmic way, really. The country has imploded. I have good friends there who just, the stories they tell are hard to believe. The houses that I know, for example, big old manor houses or even the castles in, in Waterford that I knew when we were there, that traded hands for millions of euros 
when we were there now are uh, can't be sold for hundreds of thousands of euros. There's just no one buying anything. So Ireland, it would seem, could be headed toward the point, at, because the market is still falling, but I think it could be headed to the point where it would be a buy, because it just will, in another year to two years, will likely be so cheap that especially if you just have always dreamed of, of a place of your own on the Emerald Isle, I would say that in another year to two years would be a really good time to start looking. The place I recommend most strongly is France. And I, I lived in Paris for four years and loved it and eventually will go back to Paris and, and hope to live there more or less full time again at some point. But Paris is not a bargain destination. It's not, it doesn't have to be super expensive, but it's not a bargain. But southwestern France is. So the region around uh, Languedoc and West is very affordable. I have a good friend who's living there with her family, and they live on a on a budget very comfortably. And you know, it's just quintessential French country life, and it, it really isn't expensive at all. And with France, though, anti-American feeling still, or uh, what do you think? No, I I don't. I would say not at all. And we never experienced anything like that in Paris. And if you were going to experience that, I guess it would be in Paris. Parisians are, you know, they're they're. Uh, they have a reputation, I guess, for being snobbish and elitist and, as you, as you suggest, for not really liking Americans. I don't think those things are true. I think that, the, that Parisians are very discreet and careful and so extremely well-mannered and proper that, the, that their behavior is interpreted as rude. <laughs> but they're, they're not at all, in my experience. What's going on with Estonia, Romania, Latvia, places like that? I, I know Romania was really being promoted for a while there. Yeah, and I have a friend who's doing a very big development, a ski resort development in Romania, and if he's struggling, you know, because markets generally around the world are so down in the past couple of years, and uh, Eastern Europe included. So if you are looking to buy in that part of the world, I do think that there are, are very good buys to be found in Romania, Poland, for example, because prices had started to appreciate before the, the kind of global fall off and now are stagnant or down and certainly very soft and in all of those kinds of markets where, where there just isn't much activity at this point, sellers would be very negotiable. Anything else in Eastern Europe you want to mention? Not in particular, no. I, frankly, it's not. A, we haven't been paying that much attention to that part of the world, except, as I say, uh, for Romania. And and I'm hoping to be able to visit in 2011 because I do think Romania, especially, is interesting to me from a from a investment point of view. Okay, great. And do you want to talk about Asia a little bit? Asia is the world's big bargain right now. Asia is cheaper than Latin America. Latin America grows more and more expensive. There's a there's a lot of inflation in this part of the world, in, depending on the country and the standard of living is improving and the cost of living along with it in, a, in much of Latin America. Asia is, is still very cheap, and I have good friends who kind of fought world. They're retired. They've been retired for 25 years, but not retired to any one place specifically. They, for 25 years, have been moving around as their interest and their imaginations drive them, but as well kind of going where the living is good and very cheap. And so when they first retired, for example, they went to Paris and they lived very well and very cheaply. Then they came to Latin America and they spent 15 years or so bumping around Latin America, especially Argentina was a place they spent a lot of time when Argentina was very cheap. But they have spent the past few years, I'd say three or four plus years in Asia, especially in Thailand and uh, India. Those are places where it's not in Bangkok, for example, uh, and not in, say, Kuala Lumpur, not in the big developed cities, but in in more remote cities and certainly outside the cities. In that part of the world, say, in Thailand, you could live very comfortably. It would be a very basic lifestyle, but comfortable on well under $1,000 a month. That's amazing. So is Thailand really the place to consider in Asia, or should people be thinking about mainland China, or are there any other places in KL, or is it really Thailand sort of the good bargain there? It depends on, on how exotic you're up for, because Thailand is a good, cheap choice, and it's kind of a well-paved uh, expat haven. There's For decades, Americans and others have been spending time in Thailand so that there are established communities. That said, it's it's really not possible 
for a foreigner, for an American, to get a full-time residency permit for Thailand. So unless you want to do the, the border run thing, which is to leave whenever your border, your sorry, your visa expires, go somewhere for three days and then come back to Thailand and start over on a tourist visa, unless you want to play that game, it's not a long-term choice. It's a place to go for a few months a year and then move on somewhere else. The one place in Asia where a, uh, a foreigner, and a, including an American, can get a full-time residency permit relatively easily is Malaysia. They have a program called Malaysia My Second Home, and they they make it very user-friendly for an American to, to get a full-time legal residency permit to live there. Well, kind of summing everything up, first of all, just before we go here, I'll, I'll ask you, is there any place that I didn't ask you about that you'd like to mention in particular? Oh, yes. In fact, there is. A place that I'm very, very keen on, and I'm, is where I'm going to spend New Year's. We're going to spend the first week of the year there in uh, Medellin, Colombia. Really? And uh, Medellin is, is just the most beautiful, charming city I've discovered in a long time. I was there for the first time this year. I've been wanting to go for years because friends have been telling me how nice it is. And it really is just uh, disarmingly uh, impressive. It's also very affordable. Real estate is a super bargain. Real estate prices in Medellin remind me of prices in Panama City 10 and 12 years ago when I first started traveling here to Panama City. It's also very safe. I know you say Medellin, people think drug war. They think they think kidnapping. <laughs> That's what they think. It, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's not the case. It's a very safe place. I, I spent a lot of time there this year traveling around with my husband, but also on my own, and uh, I never felt uncomfortable, much less unsafe. It, although you're kind of blazing a new trail. You're, you'll find that there aren't many Americans there, but that the people of Medellin will welcome you, and they're very happy to, to discover you and to chat with you if you can chat with them. The, there are some downsides because it's so undiscovered uh, by outsiders, uh, no one speaks English to speak of, so you really have to have some Spanish to get around. Uh, and it's it's not a user friendly place because it's it it is just so off everyone's radar. And more than that, people have avoided it consciously. So, for example, things like residency permits and opening a bank account; these things are very difficult. But if you can either just ignore them by not trying to move there full time, they you know a residency permit only becomes an issue if you want to live there year round. So don't just go for you know go now and then. And that's our idea. We're hoping to buy an apartment there so that we can go over from Panama City regularly and just come go back and forth. Fantastic. Well, you are really a wealth of information, Kathleen, and it's just awesome to hear all this. Maybe to sum things up, why is it that an American, for example, or a Canadian, why is it that someone in a highly developed North, North American country would want to consider this international perspective? Why would they want to consider looking overseas? I mean, what are really some of the drivers for this type of thing? Maybe, maybe people listening haven't considered it before, and you're talking to them. A big one is cost of living, uh, and this is a tough one at the same time, it's possible to live a very comfortable, even a, a well-appointed life in a lot of very nice places around the world on a budget. But there are trade-offs. You can move to a beautiful spot on the ocean, on a river, in, in a colonial city, for example, and live a very comfortable life on a, on a budget much smaller than, than you're probably used to that wherever you're living in the United States right now. But there's going to be no Walmart down the street. Domino's isn't going to deliver at 10 o'clock at night if you decide you want a pizza. You may not get cable TV. There are definitely trade-offs. So I, I like to point that out because I talk about how cheap it can be to live. You know, to say you can live in, in parts of Thailand on well under $1,000 a month, it's true. And I know people doing it and they're very happy and they have everything they need, but they might not have everything that sometimes they want. They don't have Domino's and Burger King and Walmart, for example. So the cost is, a, is an important issue. And as the baby boomer generation reaches, you know, gets ever closer to actual retirement, many are really panicked, in fact, wondering, all right, I, I had a bigger nest egg over the past couple of years. I've maybe lost some of it in, in the form of losing ex value of equity in my home or investments haven't worked out. Things have gone kind of south. So now my nest egg is smaller than I thought, maybe much smaller than I thought it was going to be. Can I possibly afford to retire in the United States? Baby boomers are looking at not 10 years of retirement life, but 20 or 
more years of, you know, a couple of three decades of retirement. They're uh, relatively young and healthy at this stage of their lives. So cost is an important one, but I like to balance that immediately with quality of life and experience of life because not only does moving overseas maybe reduce your cost of living dramatically, but it increases your quality of life in ways that you can't even expect or predict. Your life just becomes very adventure-filled and full of the unexpected. And at this point in their lifetimes, baby boomers not only look around and think, well, geez, can I possibly afford to retire on my nest egg? But what is that retirement going to look like? You know, what am I going to do for 20 or 30 years? And when you start to think that way, you realize, well, geez, I'd like to do something new. And you look around and think, well, maybe there's something new and different and more fun somewhere else. So it's a it's a phase of life where you can, you can rather than just kind of living out your life, you're, you're launching a whole new life. It, you know, can be remaking yourself entirely. Then there's there's another side to it, which some people are, are keen to get out of the United States right now for more kind of political reasons, uh, more ideological reasons. They're unhappy with what's going on with uh, things like, the you know, health care and new legislation aimed at, at restricting Americans' rights and freedoms to do with with managing their own financial future, for example. And that's a that's a, a growing issue. And a lot of people are, it's very American to think, you can't tell me what to do, and if you try, I'm going to go somewhere else. And uh, and so I think that's at play for a lot of Americans right now, too. Yeah, no question about it. Well, Kathleen, where can people find out more? Give out your websites, if you would. My group is called Live and Invest Overseas, so it's liveandinvestoverseas.com. And if you go there, I publish a free daily e-letter and talk about all these things we've been talking about, all these topics, all these countries and many others. Uh, and you can sign up on the homepage if, you, if you'd like to hear more about these ideas. Excellent. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for sharing all of this information with us. We really appreciate having you on the show, and we'd love to have you back. You're like an encyclopedia of international affairs. (laughs) Well, thank you very much. I appreciate being invited, and I'll look forward to talking to you again. Thanks much. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Are you ready to begin making huge profits in mobile homes and mobile home parks? If so, check out Mobile Home University's Boot Camp in a Box. You'll learn how to find and evaluate mobile homes and mobile home parks, how to drastically reduce park expenses, how to develop an effective management team, how to market and advertise to fill up your park, and much more. The Mobile Home University Boot Camp in a Box is available at special savings at jasonhartman.com. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.